Alright, uh, can you guys hear me? Alright, um, so my name is Han, uh, I'm a grad student at BU and this is kind of a collaboratory work. Um, over the summer at Red Hat with my inter, uh, well, my mentor uh, Sanjay, um, he gave a talk earlier about like deep learning stuff and uh, here we're kind of uh, trying to kind of try to apply that to something that's uh, more in the uh, systems side. So. So in terms of uh, operating systems and physical hardware itself. Um, so actually before I kind of talk about why we want to do something called uh, configuration of these hardware, kind of start off with some motivation about why we want to do this. Um, so mainly just talking about a little bit of a um, kind of the evolution of uh, uh, CPU architecture history. So hopefully all of you are familiar with kind of Moore's law um, for for the longest time, we've had the benefit of you know doubling the amount of transistors uh, on on the actual processor, and it's it's been on a very nice trajectory until about a, a decade ago, where we cannot actually physically shrink those transistors anymore. And and uh, one of the one of the things that impacted that well, was actually the uh, dinner scaling. So. The data scaling actually made Moore's Law useful because it basically said that as you double the amount of transistors, uh, the amount of like, uh, thermal dissipation to actually cool the increased transistor count actually stay constant. So that effectively means that by doubling your transistor count, you're using about the same power to run your applications. You're kind of doubling your performance in a way. And roughly about a decade ago is where this trajectory is no longer possible, right? And that's kind of where we are in the modern era leading on where we cannot actually shrink the transistor die anymore without causing a tremendous heating cost and also impacting performance because you cannot actually keep all the, uh, all, all the logic operating all at the same time. And to kind of address this from both the software's perspective, so like systems research and also hardware perspective, there's been multiple approaches, right? Because because for the longest time, systems research, we've always uh, relied on the fact that every four years or two years, we can double our performance, so, right? Uh, by, by just switching to a newer hardware. And, and that has impact in terms of like the design of the hardware, uh, design of the software, et cetera. And to kind of tackle this, the fact that we cannot rely on having uh, faster clock cycles, uh, a lot of the, there's been a, a lot of user level software kind of like this to take advantage of, 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 of the hardware better, right? So DBDK is kind of like a, uh, kind of like a user level library that lets you gain raw access to the hardware to process uh, packets. And there's also other, these other libraries to, you know, uh, take advantage of these accelerators, uh, vector accelerators. They're increasingly, they're very common, in almost uh, all kinds of data centers. And there's also been kind of like a, uh, kind of explosion recently in terms of unit kernels, right? There's all these different unit kernel projects where the idea is that you can use a high level uh, language to build a kernel that's kind of specialized for your application. And it's a uh, single address based single process, right? And, and the whole point is that a lot of the overhead of our traditional operating system where we kind of always written them uh, because we wanted them to be uh, adapted to different kinds of workloads, et cetera, uh, if you really want a shooting for performance for like a single set of workloads, for example, it might, a unit kernel might be better for that. And at the same time, there's been kind of a gigantic heap of different kinds of hardware that's been added into a system too, right? For different kinds of accelerators, uh, there's also programmable stuff they've added into these. So this is like a programmable SSD. You can actually write logic in there, write code, and it will actually operate on data as it's being written to the SSD. Uh, there's also programmable memory also, and then, you know, there's FPGA, et cetera. And there's also a lot more different kinds of like uh, devices to talk. And there's also different layers of uh, memory network, uh, memory layers now, right? I think it's about seven or eight, if you consider like the, uh, whatever the newest memory, uh, the non-volatile memory stuff. And, and with these uh, different hardware, a, a question we can ask kind of is like, how could we so if we so we if we are running kind of like a customized software for a single application where we even customize the uh, system itself, could we actually customize the the hardware for a single application? And what would that mean, right? Customizing the hardware. The hardware is already customized enough. How much more could you customize it? Uh, and in this case, 
the hardware we're kind of focusing on is a network card, right? So a network card exists in all systems. Uh, you know, every time you send a packet, the packet goes through the network card and goes up through your operating system stack and actually fetches you the data. So at a high level, uh, this is how the uh, the tool chain, I guess, in a way of how how packet receives work in like a modern system, right? You get your packet uh, onto the NIC, and on the NIC itself, there's a set of queues, uh, like receive queues, where the packets are basically every packet receives, it puts it in this queue, and the packets here are basically DMA to some region of memory that your system allocates. And with that packet data, eventually when it's ready to inform the software or the device driver that you're ready to handle it, uh, interrupt gets fired and there's like a software interrupt handler that then processes the data and then passes it up through the network stack to your application, right? So transmitting kind of the same in reverse, you're just kind of adding your payload with the additional headers on top, putting on the transmit queue and sending it out, right? So this, this pipeline is the same for almost all network cards. And the, the kind of interesting thing about uh, the network card uh, we are specifically looking at here is this uh, 10 gig e network card uh, from Intel. Um, I think it was released about maybe eight years ago. Uh, so 10 gig e is still kind of being used. It's not that bad yet. Uh, but the interesting uh, thing about it is that if you look at the actual uh, data sheet for this network card, uh, there's about 5,600 of these registers that exist on there that you can actually write into. And these values are 32-bit are registers, and they have different impacts for, for different for, for the way the card behaves. And a lot of them, you know, it's kind of like a pie graph of different, different parts of the card. And so there are a lot of these values, and part of uh, my job was to kind of see uh, which of these values actually um, uh, make a difference in terms of the operation of the device, right? So, so here's just a table of some of them, and 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 the configuration I'm kind of talking about is basically uh, this. I'm just kind of looking at this entry right now, uh, which is the which is the uh, hardware interrupt delay value. So, so this hardware interrupt delay value is basically a value that you can set on the card where after it's received the product uh, a packet. Um, it, it delays for a certain set of microseconds before firing the interrupt and letting the software know that it's time to process the packet. And when the, proce and when the processor gets the interrupt fired, it will basically pull as much as it can, either through some budget or pull until some time, but, and basically try to process as many packets as possible that exist on the card. And the simple math of just multiplying these possible values together is a huge configuration state, right? Uh, like 10 to 20 different possible states that you can set just a very just a set a subset of these and 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 for the rest of the talk we're kind of like I mentioned we're kind of just interested in investigating uh, what like how how could we configure this value for your application like delaying the delaying the hardware interrupt value um, and then the kind of general question of kind of this pro project is like, can you actually do it in an automated way where you don't have to manually uh, either uh, manually run your uh, benchmark to kind of figure out how, how, to, uh, how, to, how to tame this complexity of setting all, all these values? And, the, and the, the area where kind of, since it's like a, like a machine learning section, we're kind of trying to use machine learning techniques to kind of learn about uh, the, the best way to configure uh, this device. Uh, and I'll, I'll get on to that kind of towards the end of this talk. Um, the first part of this talk is kind of just investigating uh, whether whether actually setting this value makes a difference uh, for a set of applications. And what would that mean uh, when we actually apply it uh, using machine learning techniques to learn about these? Uh, okay, uh, okay, I just skipped that slide. Yes. <laughs> so, so the so the kind of question is first question is if we just change these hardware configuration parameters from whatever the default values are uh, being set by Linux, could we get better performance for an application? Uh, in this case, we kind of use a very simple toy problem just to understand end to end because we don't want something complicated where 
you're running a high-end like benchmarking tool where packets are coming in some like uh, randomly sampled distribution, right? We want a simple thing where we can reason about like, uh, okay, this is how many packets I should be getting, this is how many interrupts I think I should be getting, etc. So in this case, we kind of have like a uh, application called NetPipe where you kind of just send between two machines uh, that are under VLAN and then so it's mostly quiet. Uh, they're basically connected to a switch and they just ping pong back back and forth each other uh, with with a packet of size M for some N iterations. And it's a synchronous uh, benchmark where a guy sends it and then the other guy receives it, it sends a response back, which is the same packet and maybe some ACK packets, et cetera. And we're just measuring like what is the throughput to do this ping pong back and forth. Right, and, and, the, and the knob we're turning here is this interrupt delay value. So this interrupt delay value uh, just affects the single machine where the single machine is, is, the, is the server machine where we're saying we're gonna keep everything else as in kind of like a black box. We don't really care how they're, how they're configured outside of the single machine. We just want the server to be configured where we, 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 we tune the interrupt delay. Uh, so, so, so initially we kind of did like a very static search. So, and that's what kind of all these graphs are showing where on the x axis we're kind of just uh, tuning or changing the interrupt delay values. And on the y axis is the measure throughput. And then all these different bars are kind of for like different, different message sizes that we tested with. And we kind of generated like a 3D surface of them that, that we've been just adding to it because it's actually, uh, it would take a very long time to run all possible message sizes on all possible delay values, right? So we kind of just took a kind of like a random sweep through some message sizes to see whether there was anything. And the kind of interesting we found was at a message size of 10 kilobytes or roughly in this range, uh, if you set the interrupt delay value to about 40 microseconds, you get about like a 50% increase in your throughput versus compared to 20 microseconds. Obviously, there was a a bunch more, but I'm just showing a couple ones to show you. And the default one is actually uh, the policy that exists currently, which is a kind of more dynamic policy inside Linux, where uh, every time you get an interrupt, it, it uses some statistics of uh, how many packets it's seen so far, and it, it computes like a new uh, interrupt value that is within some range, for example. So it's kind of more dynamic policy, which will make sense because Linux is kind of like the entire yeah, which kind of makes sense because it's hopefully more adaptive to different kinds of workloads. But in this case, since we're just measuring one, we're hoping that maybe it could adapt to it too because it's just sending one packet back and forth. Uh, but it's kind of interesting that at a very specific uh, interrupt delay value, a very static one. So in this case, uh, we're doing this statically. So we just set up, so we just set the interrupt delay value once and we never touch it and we just leave it, right? And, and it's kind of interesting to figure out what is going on here. How are you able to get like a 50% boost in your throughput by setting your interrupt delay value to 40 microseconds uh, at a very specific message size, right? So one of the things that we tried looking at is basically uh, adding, uh, instrumenting code to kind of log every single packet it's seen uh, when, when an interrupt gets fired. So, so so in Linux uh, packet processing, there's something called a uh, new API, which is basically every time a interrupt gets fired and your, your interrupt handler is called, you're basically, at that point, you're basically, you have a budget for how many packets you can process before you, before you, uh, before you get context switched out or, or you stop processing, right? So, so, so that budget is a limit for how many packets you can process at, at once, once the interrupt gets fired. So if there aren't enough packets to be processed, then, um, then you would just process as much as possible and you stop. Otherwise, you have a budget for how many. Yeah. Yeah, but, there, but when you're sending a packet, it could get, uh, depending on how TCP does it, right, there could be multiple packets, in which case, yeah. So, yeah, so that's kind of the effect we were trying to see, which is where, like, how, and, and, and this measurement here is basically, other than the payload packet, how many other packets are acknowledgement packets, right? So this means, like, on average, for every single receive, for every single interrupt that gets fired, 
uh, this is this is how many uh, acknowledgement packets were, were appended to the to the actual payload packet, right? Because uh, in TCP they, they do something like piggybacking where you piggyback the acknowledgement packets, right? So so what this kind of shows is in this example is that at a 40 microsecond delay we are we are more I guess efficient in terms of uh, processing acts, as in we. We, we hit some threshold and some delay value where we're, we're being more efficient in terms of uh, how we process, you know, acts because we're processing more acts than these other examples. Um, so, th I mean, that doesn't necessarily explain uh, <laughs> everything. It's just uh, a metric that we're trying to measure to try to understand this phenomenon that we saw. Um, uh, a couple of other metrics uh, that we measured was a, the, the amount of interrupts that got fired uh, total for this workload. Also, the how much instructions uh, were run uh, throughout this benchmark, right? So, so for example, we see. So one interesting thing is we actually ran way less instructions here compared to everything else. We also have way less interrupts than everything else, and 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 the workload is the same across all of these, right? So we're just sending n packets n times, and it's the same across all of these. And the only hardware parameter we changed was this. So, so you may think about so kind of our intuition for what is going on here is the fact that we are we are more efficient in terms of polling in a way because 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 every time an error gets fired, your card is doing a sort of polling to pull as much packets as possible. But if there if but if your error rate is not correct in terms of optimizing the amount of packets coming in, so you're polling in a very much more efficient rate, then you're just wasting CPU cycles, right? So what this kind of shows us is that. At this 40 microsecond delay, we hit some threshold with the other app, with with the message size and the other client, that we are able to be much more efficient in terms of uh, 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 processing packets, basically. And and a lot of this is just kind of trying to uh, look at look at measurements that exist in the system in terms of measuring how how it's running, right? When when we're kind of uh, tuning these hardware parameters. Yeah, no, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, this is the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is not necessarily 5,000, because uh, for this run, we're sending 10,000 kilobytes uh, 5,000 times. So that kind of implies that the GCP stack probably split the packets into multiple short sizes and sent those instead, and we're getting a bunch of interrupts there. Yeah, yeah, it's. Yeah, MT is 1,500. It's just the default. Yeah. But the other unintuitive sense might be is that the fact that for the for the default one, which is the Linux default policy, it has way less interrupt than anything we've seen before, uh, and its its instructions is slightly lower than the other ones, but not not as much, right? It's also able to process the acts very efficiently, and for some reason, its throughput is the same as the others, right? So that's kind of weird, and. And to kind of try to investigate what's what's going on in that in that in the dynamic policy, uh, we basically logged throughout the whole run uh, all the every time Linux updated its interrupt value, we just stored it, and this is a dump of it, right? So this is what the actual dynamic policy is doing throughout the run. It's I think what this basically shows is that for this benchmark, it probably not it's it's not doing a good job of adapting to it, right? It's doing like a large search throughout the space. And the interesting thing about this is that uh, by default, it only sets its interrupt values from zero to about 120 something. So that's what this peak here is. Uh, but but you can actually set it way higher, up to about over a thousand microsecond, if you want. Uh, so 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 what this kind of this kind of explains that maybe at some point it's like delaying too long, right? So it's delaying too long. It's not responding back fast enough. In which case, you're kind of suffering the. Uh, uh, since you're not responding fast enough, it's, the sender's not responding fast enough either, and you're kind of throttling yourself in a way. Um, so this could be, yeah. So I'm not saying the policy is bad in any way. It is for this workload, it's probably not doing as well as it could. Um, another workload that we ran that could be probably more realistic than just ping-ponging packets back and forth is uh, actually memcached, right? So memcached is commonly used when you delegate the whole system. Uh, it's a in-memory key value store, and most of the time you run it under some SLA, right? You're saying I want 99 percentile of my requests under like a thousand microseconds, for for example, right? And 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 our goal here is can you maximize 
is there a way by tuning like the interrupt delay to maximize your queries per second while while maintaining this SLA, right? Which is kind of unintuitive because if you're talking about latency sensitive, then shouldn't you just be polling all the time, right? You never want to be delaying your interrupt because you want to handle that interrupt immediately uh, while 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 maintaining your uh, your tail latency. And the interesting thing that we found is uh, we ran this. So basically, the way we ran this is we ran uh, the same server and client, except this is multi-core, so eight cores on both sides, uh, and we and we basically measure the the max QPS it could hit or queries per second it could hit while maintaining a thousand microsecond tail latency under a uh, ninety-nine percent tail latency under a thousand microsecond, and we just increase and we did like a linear stand through this uh, delay value, delaying the interrupts, and we just kind of plotted this right, so. It's relatively uninteresting that basically, as you increase your delay, uh, your queries per second doesn't really increase at all. At all, uh, nor does it really decrease badly until you hit these later kind of weird cases where you really shouldn't delay this too much, right? Uh, but the interesting thing, if you think about what what does delay interrupt really do? If you're delaying interrupt, that means that you're delaying the handler code for the interrupts, right? So if you're able to delay as long as possible, and and the moment that you want to handle it, you're much more efficient at processing those packets. What you're actually saving is actually power usage, right? So if you and this is the same plot except we measure uh, the t the amount of power it uses over time. So so basically, what this means is that you can actually delay your uh, you can actually delay the interrupts while maintaining the the, the, the throughput that you got, the queries per second, but doing it at a way, uh, doing it at lower power throughput, right? Which is over here. And and we and we did kind of did a comparison between what Linux uh, the default had, along with Linux with uh, BusyPoll uh, doing. So BusyPoll is kind of like a setting you can enable on the device where you say, here's Busy, I turn on BusyPoll and I give you a budget. What BusyPoll does is after the interrupt gets fired and it starts processing packets, it will actually pull a bit longer because it's trying to anticipate that you might want to pull a bit because you're latency bound, right? And if you, and then we, we calculate the per core interrupt because this is a uh, eight core run uh, of, and, and we compare them, right? So you can see that by doing a static delay of this value, we actually have a slightly lower interrupt rate than even doing busy pull, right? So I guess the kind of hypothesis here is the fact that uh, by doing this kind of static delay, you're able to kind of do a, I guess, a smarter version of busy polling where, where the moment your interrupt gets fired is when you're, when you're processing packets at a much more optimal rate than you're just randomly either do some uh, heuristics or or do some actual busy polling, and that's kind of uh, and and if you actually want to really decrease latency, uh, which is kind of a separate thing, that would be more systemic changes to the way your system stack works, right? And the way like packets are cop copied to user space, etc. Uh, but in this case, we're kind of showing that uh, the technique of just delaying your interrupt or Delaying when to packet when when to do packet processing, you, can, you are able to actually get benefits that may not seem obvious. Uh, and another interesting example that we did was instead of worrying about uh, tail latency, for example, uh, we can just in, what what if what if we just care about pushing the queries per second by increasing the pipeline? So pipelining here just means that we're going to pipeline sixteen requests at a time versus earlier where we weren't doing any pipelining. So pipeline basically destroy your tail latency, but you can increase your queries per second for the same uh, uh, memcached workload. And here, this red bar is kind of the, the the throughput where Linux is. And here, with this, we actually found that if you increase your delay to a completely unintuitive level of 800 microseconds, you actually do the best in terms of maximizing your ops per per second. Right. So we still need to spend some time to kind of understand. Uh, this value because uh, almost no network cards set your delay value this high. Yeah. Yeah. 
when the first packet comes, it will wait the amount of time before firing. So after the first, the controller will. Like the, uh, I'm talking about the, the actual hardware that fires the interrupt to the device driver that, that then handles it to the uh, network stack. Yes, because the, the hardware will fire a IRQ uh, that you have to register with a function, and yeah, yeah, it's that one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the uh, hardware limit for that one. Uh, yeah, it's yeah until basically a millisecond on that specific device. That's that's how long you can wait max, basically. Um, so so most of this so far is kind of just uh, understanding uh, what does what does changing one of these hardware parameters mean, right? Uh, the other thing we're kind of interested in is to kind of instead of doing this manual search, could we do it more smarter by kind of feeding it to some sort of uh, machine learning algorithm, in this case, reinforcement learning, uh, where, you know, you can think of the agent as maybe the software or device driver, and the environment is like the, oh no, the agent is maybe probably the network card because the agent is doing some sort of action, and the action itself is it's, it's tuning the device, it's setting the device at a certain value. And the environment is basically your your system software, right, or your application, and it's gauges. And given given that action, uh, are you able to get some reward in this case, like doing better in terms of throughput or lower latency, and and feeding doing this and doing this feedback loop of uh, of a self improvement system. Um, in this example, uh, in this case, uh, it's something that we're kind of still working on, uh, <laughs> we're, because it's kind of a there's a lot of challenges with the learning aspect of this that we're still figuring out. Uh, so I kind of talk about some of these challenges uh, because we're still trying to understand both from a like systematic systematic sense of what does changing the hardware mean to the system, and also how can we present this as a problem to even a learning algorithm to learn, right? So, so like. Should, you know, should, should we be using kind of like supervised for something like this, uh, unsupervised, like where where we kind of give it like a like a reinforcement learning approach, or kind of like a more supervised approach where we basically run a bunch of experiments, real experiments, and gather raw numbers and just feed it to like a uh, like a SVM or some sort of classifier, right, with actual labeled data, or some or 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 should we stick to some sort of like statistical method or some heuristics, right? That is that is more that is different than what what it has right now. Uh, there's also, I guess, some challenges of measuring like of goodness, uh, because because when you consider traditional uh, AI uh, like reinforcement learning stuff, right, it's being applied in stuff like robotics and image uh, image processing, right, where you have a clear goal of whether Either it works or it doesn't. In this case, it's more, it's not that clear cut whether something is better. It could be better because for that specific message size or that for that specific workload, uh, the goodness doesn't translate as well across different kinds of uh, workloads. And, and, and I guess it's important to kind of, that, and something that we're still trying to understand, which is how do we, how do we measure this uh, to kind of understand whether it is doing good or not. Um, I guess, uh, and also applying this to actual hardware is kind of an unknown error, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, yeah. That's a uh, like another box of questions to be asked. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm not. I, 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 honestly, I don't know what the answer to that solution is. Whether, 
yeah, whether it's possible. But if we just focus on making like one application work in a way, I think that's for me that's like uh, a progress because like like the the issue here also is the fact that we are actually learning f from the physical hardware itself and how it operates, right? Like how can you actually even simulate this? Because like to actually run each of these experiments is very expensive because you have to run through the entire software stack and the hardware itself. And there's all these interactions that you, you do not have control over versus maybe a more simulated environment, right? And maybe that's also part of the challenge, which is like, how do we extract meaningful data from this? Um, and yeah, so in, yeah, <laughs> that's kind of an abrupt end because <laughs> the learning aspect we're kind of working, we're still working on. Uh, hopefully, maybe I'll have much better stuff to show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is really just a simplistic servo loop in the device driver itself, in the Ethernet device driver itself. It's not nothing to do with Linux kernel. Well, it, it would. Uh, so the policy of setting the interrupt delay is in the device driver itself. Uh, it's in the yeah yeah. It's in the device driver code itself. Right. I mean, it looks like it's just a simple loop that says. It is. Something better, worse, and just yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, yeah. It's base. Yeah, I have. It's it's like a maybe like a forty line switch statement based on certain assumptions about like the peak optimal way this should be running, and it's like switches between certain values, and and, and that's it. Uh, yeah. So so that could be adapted. That that could be much better, I guess. And, and, Yeah, and yeah, and and you know, it doesn't have much application state because it's literally looking at how many packets it's received and how many packets is sent, and using that as a metric. And perhaps, like some of these other measurements, like some of these other metrics that we measure, might might be more interesting to 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 use it for also, right? Um, and also, I guess here it's a very simple ping pong application too, right? So maybe it's not it doesn't do well in that case. Maybe it does well in this other case where like there are multiple network multiple applications of different demands and then maybe can adapt to that better also. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is the, uh, thank you for attending my talk. Uh, if you guys have any questions, <laughs> I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs> yep. When you increase the delay period, right, uh, there was that one graph that the input would be out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so too. Um, yeah, because the the pipeline here is sixteen, so it can for every core it can send sixteen requests uh, one after the other. So so that means when you're getting a packet, when you're getting an interrupt, and you're pro processing them, it, it, I think delaying longer is much better in this case, right? Uh, like the default policy can never go beyond this much delay, basically, because it's it's hard coded to be about a hundred something. Uh, whereas the physical card itself, you can go up to a limit of a thousand microsecond, right? So it's basically a space that it cannot ex actually explore. There must be a relationship between that message size, obviously, right? Because the shorter message, you stack it, you get the weight. Yeah, yeah. Once you run past the end of your message, you've got nothing Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. It's, it's just about filling the, the ingress buffers, right? Yeah. Yeah. So then you can do all the processing. Well, you're probably having, you're going to have fewer transitions per memory size from kernel space to user space because you're copying buffers. Yeah. 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 So I think the interesting here is that there, maybe there is some very nice threshold you can hit where you're doing that much more efficiently than some other. Uh... Do you have, an, I know it's not the size, but do you have the comparable 99% latency drop as you, or is that prior? Oh, for this one? Yeah. Uh, yeah, this one is actually interesting. So the tail latency in this case was about six milliseconds for the request. And actually, at this point, at this 800-something microsecond delay, it had the lowest tail latency, about 500, uh, at five, five milliseconds. 
Yeah, no idea why that's the case. <laughs> versus the versus the Linux one. I mean the yeah tailings. I don't know if you want to care about tailings. Yeah, like five 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 milliseconds. Maybe you do. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Um. Yeah, that would be. Hmm. Well, yeah. Yeah, because the device, yeah, the device itself has about 500 kilobytes of storage of packets. But once it gets it, it will like DMA to some memory region in your system. Uh, because you know, when you when you set up the device, you tell it, "Here's my memory," and you can write your data to it. It will just DMA. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I've seen the case where you actually overflow the device itself. Yeah. All right. More questions? Thank you.